good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation. Welcome wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. Our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest Ben Sidran and I'll introduce Ben in just a moment. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. First, please do ask questions. Uh, you can do this by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility on your screen. We will do our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Um, can I also draw your attention to the chat facility? Uh, this allows you to send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. Finally, this event is being recorded. It will appear on the Millim website at millim.org.uk in the next few days. There you will find recordings of other past events, as well as details of our future programme for which you can book tickets. And so to our guest this evening, Ben Sidran is a singer, songwriter and jazz pianist. He's a former member of the Steve Miller Band and he's recorded 37 solo albums. It might be more than 37 by now. He's also produced recordings for artists such as Van Morrison and Diana Ross, uh, was music producer for the award-winning winning film Hoop Dreams, and has hosted shows on both radio and television. Ben holds a PhD in American history from Sussex University. He's also an author who's written several books. Uh, there was a fire, Jews, Music and the American Dream, was first published uh, 10 years ago, but it has recently been updated and revised, and this will be the basis of our discussion this evening. Ben recently performed just a few days ago at Ronnie Scott's in London, but he's back home now. He joins us from Madison, Wisconsin. Ben, a uh, warm millim, welcome to you. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you. Now, the book, uh, the, the subject of the book, I suppose, is self-explanatory, uh, Jews, music and the American dream. What is it that made you want to write this book? Uh, I was the artist in residence at one point at the University of Wisconsin, a, a very fine university here in the city of Madison, where I live. And uh, what you did as the artist in residence is uh, create uh, a class that was available to a minimum of two and hopefully three separate areas of study. So it's an interdisciplinary uh, seminar. And I chose uh, music, Jewish studies and history and invented a course. Uh, it wasn't called There Was a Fire then, but it was called, I think, Jews, Music and the American Dream. And uh, it, I taught it for the semester. And at the end of the semester, it was very obvious there was not one book that could have been used as a text for this course. So I thought, well, since I have all these lectures, I'll simply transcribe them and I'll get a book. Well, it wasn't that simple. And six years later, I, I did manage to put together this, uh, this book. Why do you think it is that the, the story hasn't been told before? Well, I think uh, as elsewhere, uh, Jews in the United States are, are relatively hesitant to talk about their, Jew their Jewishness in terms of their uh, success or their striving. I mean, uh, Irving Berlin, the songwriter, uh, famously said when asked what did being a Jew contribute to his success as a songwriter, he said, absolutely nothing. I'm an American. I write American songs. I mean, I say in the book, I came to the conclusion that uh, nothing was more Jewish in America than saying being Jewish in America had nothing to do with it. Um, and so you see this line of reasoning all the way through modern times, although particularly in the 20th century. Uh, today, the assimilation of Jews in America, although there is a great deal of anti-Semitism remaining, the assimilation is, is much more complete than it was just 50 years ago. Well, maybe we'll come back to assimilation uh, later on. T tell us about the title. Where, where, where's that from? Well, um, it, it's interesting. When I was a young boy, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin uh, where I did experience uh, some anti-Semitic hazing, uh, not terrible, uh, but uh, there, there weren't many Jews in this town. I think there were 500 families out of 100,000 people. Um, and 
I was in love with music, even, you know, very young, seven, eight years old. And I, I noticed at one point that two words would jump out at me from the page of any text. One was Jew and the other was jazz. And I noticed that I very rarely saw them on the same page, almost maybe never saw them on the same page. So uh, being Jewish was something uh, like many American Jews. Once I had my bar mitzvah, I, I left the uh, Jewish community uh, for music and music became my spiritual center and remained that way uh, through most of my life. Uh, because quite frankly, it had the uh, emotional and spiritual content that one was supposed to get from organized uh, Jewish religious experiences, but which was sadly lacking. Uh, it was a conservative uh, congregation. Uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, children everywhere, I, I learned my bar mitzvah uh, by rote. I had no idea what I was saying. It, it, it didn't have any meaning at all for me. So music had the meaning. Hmm. And then gradually, as I got involved in, uh, you know, I've, as you said, I've been in the music business for decades. And uh, as I got involved in the business, I saw clearly, and actually my dissertation at Sussex uh, dealt with this, that music in America was not just a reflection uh, of the culture, but very much an underpinning of the culture, and also a great source of social justice in America that uh, even going back as far as uh, 1932 with uh, the song Brother Can You Spare a Dime, popular music in America has always been a profound underpinning of the move towards social justice. And then the idea uh, really came to life, uh, realizing that, you know, at no time have Jews been more than 3% of the population of the United States, but yet they were, in fact, let's just say 80% of uh, the folks involved in the popular music business, that there had to be some deep Jewish core element uh, in popular music, not just, you know, did it reflect klezmer or not that at all. And saying there were a lot of Jews in the business really didn't, impressed me very much. So what? What was Jewish about the American experience is what captured me. And it became clear early on that this whole idea of social justice in America was a very Jewish ideal. Uh, you know, the Statue of Liberty has a poem on it, on the base that says, give us your tired, your hungry, your tempest toss, bring them to me. I light the lamp behind the golden door. That was a poem written by uh, Emma Lazarus, a Jewish girl in 1880s. And this idea of America being a home of caring, of social justice, I believe was a Jewish idea that exhibits what I've come to say in the book, that even though the Jews at the time were searching for America during the pogroms of 1880s, America was searching for the Jews. America was very much in need of an American popular culture. Up until then, America uh, owed its songs and dance and literature and everything to Great Britain, to Vienna, you know, the Viennese waltzes. And the Jews arrived just at the time when American popular culture was being born. And so that's the American dream part of it, Jews, music, and the American dream. There was a fire, the title comes from a very interesting story. The story is this. Uh, years ago, uh, back in the Pale of Settlement, the great rabbi, the Baal Shem Tov, uh, was in charge of a community and his community was in danger. And what he did is he went into the woods, he went to a very special place in the woods, he said a special prayer and he lit a special fire. And indeed, the community was saved. And so the next generation, the Baal Shem Tov was gone. Another rabbi was there. The community was in trouble again. This rabbi went into the very special place in the woods. He lit the special fire. He said the uh, uh, special prayer, but he didn't remember the exact place. And he thought to himself, well, maybe it will be sufficient. And indeed it was. And the community was saved again. 
another generation. The community was in trouble. The community, of course, is always in trouble. This time the rabbi goes in. He doesn't remember the special place. He can't remember the special fire, how to build it. He doesn't know the special prayer. But he thinks to himself, maybe just the memory that there was a fire will be sufficient. And indeed, the memory was sufficient and the community was saved. So the book is about memory remembering yourself, not remembering anything specific, but remember to remember uh, the experience of Jews and music in creating the American dream. So my hope is that this book will create a wellspring of memory for Jews in America, particularly because Jews in America are today more in danger from assimilation than they are from uh, anti-Semitism, I believe. So memory is one of the themes you explore. Social justice is another of the themes the book explores. But you also draw many parallels with Black history, Black American history. Uh, so what, what could you share about, about this? Well, it's always been uh, an interest of mine because the music that I fell in love with at 13 after my bar mitzvah was jazz, which was essentially a, a black music. And I had a, a record by a piano player, a musician named Horace Silver. And I listened to that record over and over and over again. It was my only record. Uh, I had a little record player. It was like my memory was like uh, somebody in Alaska sitting around a fire, that record was was heat for me, it was uh, sustenance. And I came to understand that in America, uh, the African American, the black culture was uh, a reservoir of, of caring and I felt cared for because uh, I grew up in a time and a place where it, it there wasn't a lot of uh, spiritual meaning in America in the 50s. It was very much material. Uh, America had just come out of uh, World War II and the economy was thriving and uh, Jews were joining country clubs like never before. And so this idea of trying to find meaning in black music has been with me since I, I was very young. But then when I went to Sussex University, uh, I, I did a, a MPhil degree and a DPhil. And for the MPhil, I wrote a, a paper on uh, the sociology of black music in America. And I was encouraged to develop that into a full length uh, dissertation for my DPhil, which I did. And so I had thought deeply about how black music in America contributed to a kind of cult, counterculture, a culture that was based on oral communication rather than literate communication. Their history was never written down. Perhaps this was one of the reasons their music was so powerful in post-industrialized America, because it was the other. It was an alternative. And well, you know, it's not a big leap to see the connection to the Jews who have always been the other. Of course, they were always literate but they saw America from the outside. And in fact, the more I, I examined it, years after writing the dissertation on black music in America, when I was interested in examining the Jewish culture in America, it became very clear to me that Jews and blacks have a particularly strong and unusual relationship in the United States. First of all, without blacks and Jews, there would be no popular culture here. Uh, Second of all, when the Jews arrived in great numbers in the 1880s, um, they did an unusual thing. You know, when the Irish came in the 1850s, the Irish uh, had just come from the famines in, in Ireland. And also the Irish were uh, the blacks of Europe. Uh, and so what they did in the creation of uh, a, a forum, an entertainment forum called minstrelsy, is uh, they painted blacks as uh, lower uh, than than whites. I mean, they they identified up with white America. That's what minstrelsy was. It was showing blacks as foolish, as licentious, 
when the Jews came in the 1880s, they did an odd thing. They saw minstrelsy, and instead of seeing it as licentious, they fell in love with the idea of a group of people in America who experienced some of what they had experienced. They, they started refer, referring to the lynchings in the South as pogroms. They, uh, they fell in love with uh, the music of Stephen Foster. I mean, Stephen Foster was Irving Berlin's hero. Stephen Foster was not black, nor was he from the South, but his songs like Swanee River and uh, Old Folks at Home painted a picture of a South, of a black homeland uh, where people really cared for one another. And I think this really had, had an impact on the Jews who came and thought that this was a country where they could connect with their own past in a way, that there was a way not just to become American, but become American with the qualities of the Jewish experience in the Pale of Settlement, home, family, humor, and food. Uh, and the more I examined it uh, and, and read, read, uh, I read for six years the books that were available, it became obvious that the relationship between Blacks and Jews was at the core not just of civil rights in America, but something deeper and in some ways much simpler. And, and this refers to the idea of simple caring. Caring in America is best expressed in its popular music because in popular music, you have this image of a boy and a girl falling in love. This is the quintessential image of popular music as developed by blacks and Jews. That's who developed this. And it occurred that caring, just the simple act of caring, being celebrated in a popular art form was revolutionary. It didn't exist anywhere else. You know, the popular music in England at the time was Gilbert and Sullivan. That wasn't, that was a, about uh, something other than a boy and a girl falling in love. It was more formal. Similarly, everywhere else, the informality of America, the raising of the average man up which is what the, the popular music did, was peculiarly American and quintessentially black and Jewish. And this idea of caring struck me as a form of tikkun alum, of healing the shattered world. I mean, if two people can care about each other, then we can all care about each other. Caring becomes possible. And uh, there's a line in the book, you know, the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is indifference. And caring is the antidote to indifference. So this is just a, a very quick uh, parse of the black Jewish connection in American popular music. Where, where is that collect connection now? Because um, there is some hostility uh, towards the Jewish community in certain areas of, of, of the black community? Absolutely. Well, uh, things started to go uh, sideways in the late 60s uh, between blacks and Jews uh, during the black militant movement on campuses and uh, during uh, the anti-Semitic of uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Malcolm X was his follower at one point, Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitic canards, uh, including, of course, uh, the blood libel canard that were being spread in black America. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible irony, and not just an irony, but a, but a, a, a crime, really, uh, because the Jews had been the biggest supporters of the NAACP, of the movements, not just popular culture movements, but political movements uh, to support black America. And uh, so uh, gradually, but not so gradually, uh, Jews became the other, the enemy. You know, I, I'm in mind of a book, a British book called Jews Don't Count, which I suppose you know, uh, where uh, the author talks about how Jews are the only minority, 
not just in America, but in the world who are not included in the new push for acceptance of minorities. The Jews are seen as privileged. Well, I grew up not privileged. We grew up uh, modestly able to get by and, and many Jews in America are like that. But this idea that Jews are privileged has a deep roots in black America. Uh, and, and a lot of the people who got in the music business in the 40s and 50s and 60s came out of intimate experiences with black America. They grew up in the ghettos. They ran the grocery shops. They, they went to schools uh, with African-Americans. And uh, all of that was turned on its head by the 80s uh, with the coming of rap music. Uh, because up until then, uh, these songs, this music that spoke of social justice uh, was uh, what was called the uh, Great American Songbook. And these songs uh, lived on and were recorded over and over and over again. <laughs> and another irony, of course, is one of the things that put an end to the Great American Songbook, although it still exists, we still love it and record the music was uh, the greatest uh, avatar of uh, American popular culture, Bob Dylan, who, as a young uh, Jewish man, said, I killed off the professional songwriter. And what he was saying was, after Bob Dylan, everybody had to write their own songs, from the Beatles all the way through uh, all, all the second half of the 20th century and into today. Everybody was forced to be a songwriter. And... Of course, the record business, because of its interest in the product as opposed to the process, was totally focused on shipping as many units as possible, which lent it toward uh, sensationalism and uh, the idea of music as being a cultural heritage was kind of thrown out the window. Music became an artifact. and. Uh, by then, the Jewish industry uh, was very much uh, a professional business run by lawyers and accountants, most of them still Jewish, but very few of them willing to talk about their Jewishness or to even consider it social justice issues. And so by the 20th century, this idea of popular music as a form of social justice was pretty much uh, wearing thin. And... Uh, to the point where just a few years ago, uh, when there was this great uh, uprising, it was called Black Lives Matter in America, uh, there was almost no music attached to the street demonstrations. There was almost no art attached to the street demonstrations. This idea of popular culture being a driving force for social justice um, was stripped. And um, indeed, Black artists and some black uh, sports figures were passing along anti-Semitic canards to the extent that the great athlete uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had to come forward and say, uh, how is this possible? How, how have we forgotten that unless everybody is free, nobody is free? And we've forgotten the truth of prejudice, which is uh, it goes in all directions at once and uh, damages us all. So the the short of it is this idea today in America, anti-Semitism is very alive in America. There's no question about it. And Black America in particular uh, has trouble stepping away from the image as Jews as exploiters and privileged in America. Um, but then Black America, uh, African-Americans, have had a particularly difficult time uh, with assimilation in America. Um, and we can go off to, on that tangent. But one of the reasons it is said that anti-Semitism is so prevalent is because Black America sees Jews as being able to pass if they want because their skins are, are white generally. And that whereas Yes, they may have suffered. Yes, there were pogroms. Yes, there was the exile and the wandering 
<laughs> although maybe not, uh, blacks never had that advantage. And I think that that ultimately is really the root of the anti-Semitism, uh, that Jews can um, speak in favor of social justice, but don't suffer the consequences of social justice. And Black America has for decades now said, we don't want anyone speaking for us. We don't want Jews speaking for us. We'll speak for ourselves. Now let's, let's backpedal a bit. You were talking about the Great American Songbook. Um, I suppose some people over here might not know what the Great American Songbook is, so perhaps worth explaining. Uh, and I'm interested to know how Jewish the Great American Songbook is. Well, the Great American Songbook is simply the collection of popular songs. Uh, it, it began really with the uh, uh, popular song industry of starting really in the 1890s uh, and being leveraged very much by uh, Jewish refugees from the Pale of Settlement. What's interesting to me is that when the Jewish refugees came from Germany in the 1850s, these Jews uh, assimilated rather quickly into the American society as a whole and quickly became American. But when the Jews from uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine came, uh, these were steadled Jews. These were not people who had experiences being set as citizens. These were people who were not allowed to vote, were not allowed to own property back in the Pale of Settlement. They came to America. As I say, they identified with Black Americans because, quite frankly, Black Americans were uh, true Americans, even though they were on the outside. They were as much American as anybody. They were here from the 16 hundreds. Uh, and there was a kinship involved. And the uh, Jews got involved very quickly in, in the music business, not because they were naturally musicians. <laughs> Although in my book, I talk about the fact that, you know, music was always a powerful part of the liturgy in, in, uh, in Jewish experience. And, you know, uh, everything was chanted or sung. And, uh, you know, a prayer not lifted on the voice was not a prayer. And so uh, the Jews had no problem adapting uh, local music to liturgy. And I think it went the other way around, uh, adapting uh, aspects of liturgy to popular music. And so um, the real milestone was Alexander's Ragtime Band, written by Irving Berlin, which was an enormous, enormous hit. And it was a hit in that it sold sheet music. There was no radio play, there were no records. Sheet music is what they were selling. And the Jews quickly got involved in the sheet music business. And they created a business where a songwriter could get paid. Before that, uh, it was very difficult to, to collect any money for writing a song. Uh, uh, when uh, Stephen Foster wrote uh, Oh Susanna, for example, a huge hit he didn't get paid because there was no way to collect. And Stephen Foster died broke and penniless. Well, the Jews changed that. They invented a business of music, a sheet music business, a songwriting business. Uh, you know, Irving Berlin didn't write a lot of Jewish songs. The only one that we could find was a song called uh, Cohen Owes Me 97 Bucks. But he did write White Christmas and he did write Easter Parade. He, You know, the Jews wrote songs for all occasions. Well, Starting from that humble beginning, by the 1910s and 1920s, you have writers like Jerome Kern, George Gershwin, um, uh, dozens and dozens of, of Jews, uh, first generation Jews, and then second generation Jews, who became involved, first of all, uh, tangentially in the Yiddish theater, and then in the Broadway musicals, and most of the popular songs in the 20s and 30s. Uh, came out of Broadway musicals first, and the audience for Jew Broadway musicals was primarily Jewish. And so the, what you have is Jewish writers essentially writing these songs, these songs of caring, as I said, including songs like Old Man River. I mean, uh, w when you look at Jerome Kern's uh, writing Showboat, that was what was thought of as the great American opera that the Jews actually created 
through the musical stage, the great American opera. And so you have hundreds and hundreds of songs written essentially by Jewish songwriting teams up, up through the 50s, through the music of uh, Jerry Goffin and Carol King and all the great songs of the uh, 50s and 60s, even the songs that Elvis Presley sang, written by Jewish songwriting teams. So that entire sweep of popular music uh, from uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band through, you know, <laughs> Porgy and Bess, through Over the Rainbow, through Up on the Roof. That's the great American songbook. And that was virtually unanimously a product of, of Jews in America to the point where Cole Porter, who was not Jewish, uh, said that he had to learn how to write Jewish in order to be successful in American music. Now that writing tradition, that writing tradition uh, continued. You, you mentioned uh, Goffin and, and King, um, who were based at the Brill Building in New York. Now we had a question from Barbara uh, Kultas, who's uh, nearby in Harrogate, uh, and Barbara says, "As my maiden name was Brill, New York's Brill uh, Building fascinates me. In your opinion, what was its importance?" Uh, in 20th century jazz and, and popular music? Well, it was uh, a key, actually. Uh, there was a haberdashery store on the bottom floor of the Brill building, the, the, the Brill uh, company. Uh, and the, uh, excuse me, the phone is going to ring for a moment here. I can't stop it. That's fine. Uh, the uh, building was a warren of offices. And in each office, there was a little piano and a couple of people writing songs. They were turning out hits like Henry Ford turned out Model T Fords. They had assembly lines and they were very successful uh, for uh, 15 or so years. The Brill Building became synonymous with popular music in America. And the writers who were there uh, were unanimously, and when I say unanimously, I mean, entirely Jews, young, young Jewish uh, songwriters, uh, Lieber and Stoller, uh, first among equals, really, uh, writing the songs uh, that were then sent around to all the record companies and recorded by all the artists, uh, Jews or not Jews. And the recordings at the time of popular music were also uh, done by Jewish producers, small Jewish independent companies, and they too had offices in the Brill building. So it was a one-stop shop. You could go there, you could find a song, you could deliver it to an artist, and uh, literally within weeks, you could have the recording out on, on the market being played by radio. So the Brill building was a key. Where, where was the money? Was the money in writing the songs or, or performing the songs or making the records, producing the records? Uh, different places, different times. So, as I said early on, the money was in sheet music. Um, then uh, the money became uh, more in performances, really, because radio didn't uh, play, it didn't pay much, and and in fact, the sheet music publishers were afraid that radio was competition rather than promotion. So for years, they, they didn't interact. But eventually, of course. Uh, with the rise of uh, rights collection organizations like American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers, or Broadcast Music, uh, song uh, writing and radio play became uh, very important. Uh, and, and this was kind of a secret in, in the music business for years, because whereas the artist royalties that were due an artist were very hard for artists to collect. And this too is one of the reasons for uh, African-American anti-Semitism, because a lot of these artists uh, were African-American and they were recording for Jewish companies and uh, they were not collecting their uh, proper royalties. Uh, to be fair, it's not that the Jews were uh, not paying African-Americans, they weren't paying anybody. I mean, the business itself was like the Wild West, and it wasn't particularly a large business as it became in the 60s and 70s, when the record business went from a million dollar business to a billion dollar business. So 
eventually uh, it, it, the money went from song copyright uh, to selling records, uh, performance all the way through it. I mean, the p- performance really became important in the 30s when swing music uh, uh, was king, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw. Their performances uh, were broadcast live over the radio to the entire country. And so their shows were packed. They made a great deal of money as performers. Uh, and this continued uh, on. So you had parallel streams. Uh, now, uh, if you want to look at today, uh, copyright is uh, quite a different uh, thing. Uh, whereas back in the day, uh, a couple of songwriters would share a copyright. Today, if you look at a song on the charts, there are 12, 15 people sometimes. The song is never going to be uh, covered or uh, done by anybody other than the original person because the song doesn't exist outside of the record. Where They're not songs so much as they're recordings. We're selling artifacts is what, what's happening. Uh, so today that stream is not what it was. Uh, there are no royalties for recordings anymore because people don't buy CDs. They don't buy albums by and large. They get their money through streaming and downloading. And that's another uh, can of worms in terms of trying to collect. So uh, when you look historically at the arc of where the money is and hence where the, the businessmen were and particularly the Jewish businessmen, because, you know, uh, it's the same thing with uh, law firms. You know, the Jews were not allowed in the United States to go into white shoe law firms. They were not allowed to teach at uh, uh, East Coast universities. Uh, so they went into many businesses that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, people didn't want to have anything to do with. One of them was the jukebox business. One of them was the songwriting business. And so uh, by the 21st century, that arc had ended and it's not just that the jews didn't uh, have an interest there are many jews in the music business today it's just not a jewish business today now one of the artists you write about very extensively in the book and indeed you mentioned him before is bob dylan um i, I notice you actually have an album of bob dylan songs recorded live in Paris with a slightly jazz swing. People may wish to go and find that. I think it's on Spotify, uh, although maybe you would prefer if people went out and bought the CD. I don't know. Um, but what what, um, what what do you think it is about Dylan um, that uh, makes his his fame and his intrigue so, so enduring? He's still very, very famous. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, some of it was right time, right place, obviously. And it was the right person at the right time, right place. Bob Dylan um, uh, admired Woody Guthrie, who was uh, a social conscience songwriter and uh, was taken with this uh, idiom at a time when social justice was about to explode in America. Uh, And folk music uh, was about to become uh, popular. It never had been before really popular. Woody Guthrie was, you know, he wrote this land is is your land, this land is my land, a popular song, but nothing like Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind who have sold millions and millions of copies. So right time, right place, but also Bob Dylan. Um, up until Bob Dylan, you know, the songs were written at the Brill Building and uh, nobody when they heard a song like, uh, you know, The Drifters or Up on the Roof, these classic uh, heartfelt songs about growing up and the problems of youth. Nobody imagined uh, Carole King as being up on a roof. You know, it was there was a song and there was an artist. What Dylan did is he made the artist and the artist's authenticity a key to the sale of the song. Bob Dylan created, well, Bob Zimmerman created Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan was the product that he sold. Then on top of it all, he happened to be a genius. He is, he is and was a songwriting genius. And so everybody after Bob Dylan thought that they could 
have a swing at this. Uh, and uh, very few uh, rose to the level of Bob Dylan. So you have the opportunity, you have the timing, and then you have a young man who uh, was gifted beyond his peers. I mean, that in, in short, to me, tells how Bob Dylan started his career and then never looked back. He's still on the road. He's still on tour. Just a reminder to our audience, if you do have a question for Ben, put it in the Q&A now. Uh, we don't have too long left uh, this evening. Now, one of the defining uh, moments musically in the 1960s was Woodstock. Uh, and you do write about some Jewish connections uh, with that. So, so please tell us, please tell us more. Well, Woodstock was a, a Jewish undertaking. Uh, uh, I felt remember uh, Michael, I forget his last name right now. It's too many names in that book. Uh, who, in, who started this idea of, uh, well, let's throw a, a big party out in a field and, and see who comes. Uh, it was a Jewish undertaking, just like the Monterey Pop Festival uh, before Woodstock. Uh, was put together by uh, Jewish entrepreneurs out on the West Coast. Um, again, we're, we're in a period where the promoters, the writers, the critics, I mean, Rolling Stone magazine run by Jan Wenner, uh, a, a Jewish uh, journalist who had a lot to do with the success, not, spe not just specifically at Monterey Pop and Woodstock, but with the idea of a counterculture. Uh, because the, the, the Jewish writers and the Jewish promoters uh, were of a piece uh, during the 60s, uh, something like Woodstock, um, you couldn't say it was inevitable, but you could say uh, it lit a match, again, right time, right place. Nobody anticipated what happened there would happen. That, that 500,000 people in a field of, in, in the mud, nobody could have anticipated that. Uh, but the button was pushed by Jewish promoters, Jewish writers, and, um, and that, <laughs> that, that was Woodstock. Now you spoke about the, um, the record business going from a, a, a million to a, to a billion. What, what was it that drove that? What made it happen? Uh, young people having money, uh, the, t the teen market, which started in the 50s, uh, where suddenly there was a market created of young people who had spending money. You know, uh, w when England was still on rationing uh, the United States, had kids who were buying their own cars and portable radios and became consumers. Uh, they bought 45 RPM records. So this idea of a teenage market uh, was alive in early 50s America. And uh, by, by the 60s, and the anti-war movement, which really uh, was was amazing in the United States, and I don't think it really ever uh, was clear in in England, and and uh, probably the rest of the world, what it felt like in America. When I came to Sussex, the University of Sussex, it was 1967, and of course, by then the Vietnam War was uh, raging and. Uh, the anti-war movement uh, was on every college campus. It was, I mean, and uh, the local uh, police and, and uh, army had, had killed students and it was a revolution as it, on the streets it appeared. And uh, I, I was uh, really surprised actually, having come there and come to Sussex to see that it wasn't really an issue. The Vietnam War was not really an issue in England. There was awareness of it, uh, just culturally, as it tied into the Monterey Pop phenomenon or rock and roll or the British invasion, whatever. But not, not at all. It was an American thing. And so this idea of American youth having money 
having issues and quite frankly, having their own bodies on the line, because remember, they were drafting thousands and thousands of young Americans, pulling them out of college and sending them to Vietnam. Today, wars are fought by essentially mercenaries, professionals. Uh, then it was anybody could be drafted. So that really uh, lit another match. It was sort of like the, the expression fighting fire with gasoline. The idea of you have a youth culture, they have money, they uh, do not identify as the saying goes with anybody over 30 years old. They are using uh, uh, marijuana, they're using LSD, they're using things that are mind expanding and changing their experiences. Um, it, it was really a fulcrum of, of the 20th century. Now, you, um, as you go through the book, you seem fairly uh, well disposed and complimentary towards uh, the various artists you're writing about. And there does seem to be a, a change in tone when you come to, to Kenny G. And I get the impression you, you don't, I don't know whether you don't like him or you don't like his music, but what, what is it about what Kenny G does that really uh, winds you up? Well, you know, there's a documentary out there uh, about Kenny G. It was made uh, maybe this year. It's very recent. And in it, uh, the, the interviewer says, uh, you're, you know, how did you get involved uh, with music? And what do you really, how, why do you really care about music so much? And Kenny G essentially says, well, I, I don't really care that much about music. I like the, the technique of playing the saxophone and what's wrong with making music that's just kind of like wallpaper? What's wrong with making people feel good? And I'm an old counterculture guy where music is supposed to have meaning. And as a matter of fact, the reason I got involved with music originally, as I said, was it gave meaning to my life. I mean, it was a spiritual source. So one thing that uh, that has always bugged me about Kenny G is that he was per perfectly happy making wallpaper music. The, the, the second thing, uh, as I write in the book, which is much subtler. Uh, I, I say that Kenny G is on one end of the stick and on the other end of the stick is gangster rap mm. because gangster rap is an artificial kind of music that was supported by young whites, not simply young white Jews. Although I have to say there are a lot of bar mitzvahs in the eighties and nineties that featured gangster rap after the, after the services. Um, because these were both artificial ways of caring, of expressing emotion. Kenny G's expression of emotion is uh, pretty placid, you know, it, it, it's artificial in the sense that it doesn't really go deep into any human uh, emotion and, and intentionally so. I mean, that's who Kenny G is. Uh, whereas gangster rap is artificially inflated emotion. It's not, it's not real. It's a lie that maybe tells the truth, but it, it, it's a construct of the recording industry. And, and Kenny G is a construct of the recording industry. That's what winds me up, not just Kenny G. Okay. It's interesting what you say about um, gangster rap, um, almost that um, the, the behavior follows it rather than precedes it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not true. You know, people had a lot of trouble uh, discerning during the 60s and 70s, the lie from the truth. I mean, there was both. Mm. And the record business uh, in the 60s uh, loved pretending that it was of the people and from the people. But they were a manufacturing arm of the uh, entertainment business. And, and so uh, a lie was easier to sell than trying to manage the truth. So very quickly, uh, re recordings uh, became subject to myth making. And, and uh, I'll just start and end with the, the myth of the Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones, uh, world's most popular rock and roll band. Uh, they were marketed as street fighting men initially, right? As opposed to the Beatles who were uh, supposed to be uh, cuddly. 
the Rolling Stones were never street fighting men. They were college students, you know, one went to the London School of Economics, another one, you know, it, it, it was an act. The Rolling Stones is an act. It's a great act, but it's an act. And rock and roll music has been from the beginning an act. It's a lie that maybe tells the truth, but it's a lie. Interesting, interesting twist. Um, we have a question from Abigail Kaplan, who's in our audience. What do you see as the future of the connection between Jews and music in America and the influence on the American dream uh, and how communities interconnect? Well, Jonathan, since you've done me the great service of reading the book, know that there's an epilogue on this uh, in this book that 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 goes into some detail on that. This is a very difficult thing to answer because uh, all the things that were true in the 20th century are no longer true in America today. Um, uh, we've had, uh, and, and the, as I said, the book is uh, premised on this idea of memory, cultural memory through popular music. But there have been many uh, forces to undermine uh, popular cultural memory in the United States, uh, not the least of which is the 45th president uh, of the United States. We hate to say his name over here because the damage that he's done is so profound. But he's done a great disservice to the idea that memory is important because his whole role was that uh, truth is negotiable, facts have alternatives. Uh, so there's that problem. Uh, politically and culturally, memory itself has become less of a currency in American culture, which if you step back and you see how America has positioned itself over the years as uh, the, <laughs> the torch being raised on behalf of social justice and the idea of democracy being something that can be shared by people everywhere, uh, I don't think that exists anymore. I, I, I really don't see that America has position of the high ground anymore. And I think that memory of what the high ground felt like and meant is quickly fading. Similarly, the Jewish experience in America, such as it was during the 20th century, is, is radically different. Uh, the the uh, Jewish experience that I had and that all the, from Bob Dylan on, and that we all shared this experience, uh, was very traditional and it was uh, based on a European experience. I mean, all of the Jews in America, by and large, came out of Europe. They either came out of Germany or they came out of uh, Pale of Settlement. And so the music, the songs, the ideas, the culture that we were remembering for those who came before us, when they died, and when our generation aged, the young people, the young Jewish people in America, they don't, they don't have that anymore. They don't remember Bob Dylan, really. They certainly, uh, the Holocaust is something like the Civil War, something that happened to other people years and years ago. It's not the ghost story that haunted us in our generation. Um, so where does that leave this theme, this dissertation on caring and meaning and the American dream? Well, uh, possibly in tatters, uh, or possibly we have to look, as I say, the metaphor I use in the end of the book is, look, you see a tree moving and you notice the tree is moving, but you don't notice the wind that's blowing the tree. And so the Jewish influence in America these days is more like the wind than the tree. Uh, it still has an effect. The ideas that were Jewish ideas remain Jewish ideas. Uh, and I maintain that knowing the legacy of Jews in America, in arts, in the literature of America, in the music, in the theater, in popular culture, in comedy, in television, in films, you can see that what 
America has been, and the uh, America that is under assault today by forces, political forces, cultural forces, economic forces, uh, they're still Jewish. The Jewish part of it is under assault, maybe, but it's the Jewish part that's under assault. So are there uh, contemporary Bob Dylans and Lou Reeds waiting in the wings? Are there, are there Jewish artists with, with a message? I don't think we'll ever see that again. I don't think it's going to be individual. I think it's going to be more in terms of communal, uh, collective uh, things. Uh, obviously, for it to have an impact today, it has to have an impact uh, on, on the internet and social media, it, like everywhere in the world. If it's not important in social media, it's not important. Uh, an individual there's no way for an individual to do what Bob Dylan did because in in popular music around the world, there's no agreement on what niche is more important than what other niche. Um, so that whole uh, ecology, the, the former ecology of popular culture is gone. Just like you don't sell CDs anymore. There's not an artist that is going to do what Bob Dylan did. Somebody will come up and he'll make a recording or a bunch of recordings that bring people together through social media. Mm -hmm. And that coming together still has importance. And people identifying as part of a community has still has a, a lot of importance, but it will fade quicker as time goes on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the replaceability that has uh, the lack of permanence mm. that has taken the place of memory. And do you think possibly the democratization of um, the ability to create, now anybody can create in their bedroom, whereas previously you needed to have money or connections or uh, a certain element of soft power to be able to uh, have your music uh, heard um is there possibly some sort of inverse relationship between the the simplicity of creating and uh the the sort of lack of uh lack of um uh what's the word a lack, lack of sort of your message sticking um uh, as time goes on the fact well, you can make it easily makes it much more disposable well it, it yes absolutely and it, it increases the uh competition for shelf space now shelf space of course is virtual but there's still uh every day more and more competition for for shelf space um i'll give you an example of something that you're talking about really there's a group in america called lawrence it's a brother and sister act they're wonderful wonderful musicians they made their music at home initially and uh They've gone on to develop a, a terrific following uh, on the internet. And because of their following on the internet, they're now uh, touring and doing really well. And so they've managed to come through the gatekeepers to survive. Uh, I think Lawrence is, is a terrific uh, act. And in, in many ways, uh, their Jewishness uh, Although it's subsumed in what they do, it's there. I can see that they, they have Jewishness about them. Mm. Um, and they managed to solve the social media platform problem that if you don't solve it, you will not exist today. It doesn't matter who you are, what you write, who you move, none of it. If you can't get through the social media gates, you, you will not, it's sort of like, you will never have happened. It's like never happening at all. Uh, it used to be history happened on the streets. That's not where it happens anymore. History happens in the bits and bytes. It, and of it, course, who uh, created all the social media? We don't need to go there, but yes, the, Jewish, <laughs> the American Jewish conspiracy, as people would say. Yes. Well, Ben, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you this evening if you want to buy this book uh, there's a link on our website there's also a link in the email you'll get tomorrow uh, i heartily recommend it it's a really interesting read and uh, it, it covers many different themes and and, and levels uh, and to say thank you to you ben 
uh, I'm going to send you this. This is some of my photographs of Magan David Adom, the Israeli ambulance service in action uh, in Israel. So it might take a little while to get to you, but it's definitely on the way and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Now, just before we go, a few words about our upcoming pro programme. Next week on the 27th of June, uh, I'll be speaking to David de Jong about his recently published book, Nazi Billionaires. This book details quite shocking revelations about several uh, well-known German brands and the families behind them. Then on the 4th of July, we welcome Professor Nir Ariely, uh, Associate Professor of International History at the University of Leeds. Uh, he'll be telling us all about the Dead Sea. Um, on the 11th of July, Simon Parkin is our guest. He's speaking about the wartime internment of Jewish refugees uh, suspected of being Nazi spies. And then the following week, Mancunian Bernard Lester will be giving us a humorous look at his 50 glorious years as a dentist please do visit our website at milim.org.uk to book your tickets and make sure you sign up to our newsletter so that you don't miss out on anything. All of our events are free, but you can make a small donation to help with the cost of putting these events on. There is a link in the chat now or do visit the website. So it remains for me to thank our guest, Ben Sidran, once again. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Oh, a real pleasure, Jonathan. My pleasure. Thank you for, for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all again as a future event. Until then, stay safe. See you soon.